Hi everyone and welcome back to The Shack in 2023. Happy New Year to all of you out there in Tinternet land. And as you may have noticed, I've had a few weeks off due to firstly being a bit ill along with everyone else in the UK. And then because of the seasonal festivities, by which I mean eating and drinking too much and well, generally having a bit of downtime. But I'm back now and the first episode of the year and we're going to be looking at giving our Woody a bit of love, doing some preventative maintenance, installing a more modern video output solution so we don't have to rely on the RF signal and we'll be building and testing a modern multi-cart solution too. Okay, for the first time in 23, let's crack on. Here at The Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCBWay. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding, PCBWay also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. So this is our recap kit for the 2600, and these are around 10 to 12 pounds on Fleabay, and they're a good choice if you don't have capacitors of various values lying around the place. And there's also a replacement voltage regulator in there too. The composite mods for the VCS come in a variety of flavours and there are freely available designs on the PCBWay shared projects page if you just want to order all the components and build it yourself. This one doesn't require us to drill or cut the case in any way so that's why I've chosen it but if you're not precious about that there are versions that terminate in phono sockets rather than having trailing wires like this. These replacement felt pads aren't really necessary unless your old ones are really tatty but they were a couple of pounds and well why not. And here's our multi cartridge solution. Again there are freely available versions of this on the PCBWay shared projects page and they all pretty much work the same way. The component list is pretty small with a W27C51264K RAM chip, a 74 LSO4 logic chip, a 4 way dip switch, a capacitor and some resistors. Most VCS ROMs were 4K, so you can fit 16 of those on the 64K chip, and the 4-way dip switch selector gives you 16 possible combinations to choose which ROM you want. So we're going to build this little cartridge first, and this really shouldn't take us too long, starting with the dip switches. Always solder one corner in first, and make sure things are sitting nice and level before going back and soldering the rest of the pins. Always double check your work for cold joints. I had one here that I had to reflow and it's much easier to check at this point than wonder why things aren't working later. That looks good, so let's put in the four 10k ohm resistors. I always take the time to make sure that all my resistors are oriented the same way. Purely aesthetic, but it does bug me otherwise. And with all of the resistors in place, we'll pop in this little 104 capacitor. These don't have a polarity, so just plonk it in. With the capacitor in, it's time to move on to the dip sockets to hold the chips. We only really need to socket the EEPROM because we'll be taking that out periodically to change the assortment of games on there, unless we want to just build another cart when we want more games. But we'll socket both the EEPROM and the LSO4 just in case we do need to change them at some point. And that's it for the build on this cartridge, nice and simple. We'll pop the LSO4 in now, but we'll leave the EEPROM out as we still need to program that with some games. Okay, so now we have to open up the old girl in order that we can replace some of the older caps and then fit our composite mod. Getting inside here is relatively straightforward with six case screws on the bottom and they're soon whipped out. The top of the case can then be lifted away to reveal something quite typical of Atari machines of this era, a massive aluminium block very similar to the one found inside the Atari 800. 
In there will be the guts of the machine and this beige board we can see is only to hold the switch gear and the RF modulator which we will be removing anyway shortly. There are two further screws which hold this board to the metal block so we will pop those out. We will disconnect the RF cable from the RF modulator and then separate the ribbon connector that connects this control board to the main PCB. Let's put all of that out of the way somewhere safe for a bit while we figure out how to get inside this chunk of metal. But before we do that it seems that we can accurately date this machine as there's a little bit of paper stuck to the inside with August the 11th 1980 stamped on it. I had a look to see what else interesting happened in the world on that day and it seems to have been a bit of a light news day outside of Angola and Iran. I know that I personally was getting ready to start my first year in high school so I'd have been shooting around on my rally grifter. The best bike and no mistake and I just won't hear it from you chopper lovers. Not then and not now. <clears throat> anyway, removing the metal box requires us to remove these last two screws on the bottom of the case and then the whole unit lifts out. But we're still not done as there are a further six screws holding the base of the metal block in place. And when they're all done there are another final two screws which when removed will allow us access to the main PCB. Phew! If there's one thing that Atari liked more than huge blocks of aluminium it's screwing things together. So here we are at last, the PCB of the Atari VCS and as you can see there's not a lot to it. We have the R6532 Riot chip which handles all of the memory timing, here's the 6507 CPU, the television interface adapter or TIA which handles the display and there's this MC14050 which I didn't bother to look up but presumably is some sort of glue logic that holds things together. Ok so let's get cracking with the component refresh stroke refurb and we have a few capacitors and a new voltage regulator to pop in. There's some thermal paste included in this pack also so that we can ensure we get a good connection from the regulator to the heatsink on the board. And that's where we'll start. These voltage regulators are responsible for taking the input voltage as supplied by the power supply which can vary slightly and as a result is normally set to be over what is required and then regulating that down to a constant output voltage to the components in the machine. Any excess energy is converted to heat and dispersed through the heatsink. With the old regulator removed we will clean the heatsink up with some isopropyl alcohol before applying some fresh thermal paste and then installing the new regulator. We will secure this in place with a screw and Bob's your auntie's living lover we're done with that. However before we move on to the capacitors we'll just take a moment to do some continuity checks on the solder joints we've just done to make sure we haven't created any nasty bridges which can be very dangerous when it comes to the power supply circuitry we don't want to be shorting anything out. All looks good there so we'll move on to the caps. Now you've seen me do this a thousand times but there are a couple of points worth mentioning. Firstly against all sanity at least in my mind axial capacitors have an arrow pointing to the negative leg, radial capacitors have the longest leg as the positive. Secondly we need to make sure that old capacitors are fully discharged especially the larger ones as we don't want a nasty shock so leave the machine turned on with the power supply disconnected for a couple of minutes to make sure. There are good reasons for changing capacitors and I pretty much always do it when I'm doing an initial refurbishment of a machine even if there are no signs of leaking. The fact is that most capacitors will fail at some point even if like the ones in this machine they still look good after 40 years. By changing them out from modern replacements you're not going to be doing the machine any harm and you're likely to be extending the life of the machine a good few years instead. As always though you do you and change or don't change as you deem fit. If however you see any signs of leaking 
bulging or other abnormalities, please do change the cap straight away, as otherwise you're going to have trouble. Right, that's all of the capacitors on the control board panel replaced, and I reckon it's time for a cup of tea and a slice of cake. Lovely. So I happen to notice that although the machine appears to have been assembled in 1980, the PCB is a Rev A from 1978. So it's worth noting that down in case there are any issues. There were several revisions of the board through the years, all different shapes and sizes, and instructions for the different composite mods should but may not be very descriptive about how to do the installation, even though they're all essentially the same. Also, there was one other capacitor on this PCB that I wanted to replace, so I snuck a sneaky radial cap in there while you weren't looking. Now, this composite mod is nice and compact and has four input wires and a two-way 3.5mm output jack, which will give us some options on how to terminate the new connections. We could install phono sockets to the case, but I don't want to go drilling into this lovely old machine and instead want to use the existing cable runs and holes. The kit came supplied with this suitable cable, which will leave us with a trailing cable with phono plugs instead of the trailing RF cable we started with. Nice, tidy solution. In order to install this mod, there are a couple of components we need to remove from the board. This transistor here, and this variable resistor here. There's also mention of removing another resistor, but it doesn't seem to exist on this revision of the board. Next job is to remove the existing RF modulator as A, we don't need it and B, it's sitting right where we want to put the mod PCB. It's only held in place with a couple of solder points at the right hand side, a couple on the left and the connections for video etc from the main PCB. This was frustratingly difficult to remove for some reason but got there in the end and once removed we can send the RF unit to our spares bin should we need it in the future. Next we'll pop out that transistor and the variable resistor. The instructions state that you don't really need to remove that variable resistor, but doing so can result in a better picture quality, and as that's the point of this, we're pulling it out. And with those components removed, we'll just trim one end off our jumper wires and tin them ready for soldering to the board. We've got a ground wire, a VCC wire to carry power to the board, a video signal and a sound signal. The VCC ground and video feeds come from these points here on the PCB, but the audio signal comes from somewhere else on the main PCB. I'm not sure why we couldn't just take the sound from the same place the RF modulator did, but I'm presuming it's because the transistor we removed was part of an amplification circuit. I may have to dig out the schematics and work it out when I get the time. For now, I'm just following the guide that came with the kit and presuming there's a good reason for it. With all of the wires soldered in place, we'll connect them up to the composite mod PCB and then we'll stick it down to the board with some tape. All being well, I'll hot glue it in place at some point. And I guess there's nothing left to do but plug it all in and see if it works. Fingers crossed everyone. Well, that's a little disappointing. Time for another cup of tea and a bit of a think as to what may have gone wrong. And what went wrong was me. In removing the transistor, I'd left a rather nasty solder bridge, which I cleaned up. I also reseated all of the chips just in case. Did that fix it? Patience, my young Padawan. If it makes you feel any more confident, I think we should give the old case a good clean and then put the old girl back together again. Cleaning music, please. Okay, here's the final look of the composite mod, hot glued in place and with the wires routed correctly. I used my Mini Pro to put 16 assorted VCS games on the EEPROM and I guess now you want to see what it looks and sounds like. And the beauty of this over the RF output is that I can capture it to OBS Studio directly rather than filming the screen.
and I reckon that looks and sounds absolutely amazing and a definite step up in quality over the RF signal and I guess it also means that the multi-cart works too. Let's try a different ROM by choosing a different setting and yep that looks great too. If we zoom in on the picture you can see there's still some ghosting of the pixels which is much more evident on the actual screen than in the capture but I can't complain about this at all. So all in all a fun little project and well worth it if you've got a Woody that needs a bit of love and attention. I can't say that the multi-cart has one tenth of the charm of Uncle Clive's efforts but it does feel a bit more modern and less fraught with imminent danger. Remember to check out PCBWay's shared projects page for loads of interesting little projects like this and until next time in the shack, it's goodbye from me.